So, yeah, so thank you again, Michelle, for joining us today. We're very excited to be here with Michelle Dempsey, although now you have an additional last name. I do. I've added another one to the pile. Another one to the pile. Just collecting last names. Collecting last names. I love it. So, Michelle, <laughs> Racking them up. Um, from Moms Moving On, is, uh, is a coach, and she herself has been, or you yourself, Michelle, have been through the process of separation and divorce. I think your daughter, Bella, was two when you went through that process. Yeah. You went through the process of being a single mom, trying to get back on the dating scene. You fell in love, got married again, and now you're a stepmom to your husband's daughter as well. Yes. So you're also now in this phase of blending your family. Yes. Um, so you've really been through this whole sort of cycle that so many of us that availed divorce, so many of the people that um, we are working with are just at the very beginning stages of either considering divorce or um, for, you know that early stage of separation and trying to figure out how to move forward. And so. Your story really is a story of hope for so many people, and we're really excited to get your wisdom today on our on our webinar. Thank you. That's really nice to hear. Although, having been through this process and gotten to where I am now, um, I think it's more of a story of not so much hope, but changing your perspective and having a different mindset and a different outlook on what your reality is and, and what that can lead to if you put in the work and stay positive. Yeah. Do you want to say say more about that? Say more about uh, what you learned about the, the mindset that is most helpful? Well, I mean, in the work that I do as a divorce coach and in the women I speak to or hear from every day on social media, it's very divided. It's either I got divorced, I'm empowered, I'm moving on, I'm taking control of my life, which is how I felt, or it's I'm divorced, my life is over, my life sucks, I hate everything, life sucks, you know, I'm damaged and nobody's going to want me again. And I think the second you're able to step out of that mindset and into the opportunity mindset that divorce brings, um, you're able to feel less victimized or less able to move on. And you realize the beauty in the day to day of of what you're recreating after you get divorced. And that for me was huge, was the sense of freedom and the sense of the world is wide open, like full of possibilities again. And now I get to explore these and experience them as a mom with Bella by my side. And I think that that was the best part of it for me was realizing that, A, it wasn't that bad to be alone <laughs> after divorce because I was plenty lonely in the marriage. So now I was just alone and I could like fill that time however I wanted. Um, and I learned a lot about myself in the process. So I think taking it day by day with a positive outlook is probably the reason why I've been able to land where I am now. And I, I think that's, that's more important than anything else is just, just seeing the best in any situation. Yeah, that paradigm shift was was big for me as well when I went through my divorce. Just uh, my biggest dread was uh, losing time with my kids. And then it turns out that having that freedom to kind of rediscover myself and um, actually uh, reflect on ways that I can spend my time better with my kids was more meaningful. Um, I, I know a lot of people, whenever they first start going through the process, uh, they have this mindset of, um, I can't wait to be divorced because then I'll be done with this person. Oh, I love that you're bringing this up. Yeah. I talk and, about this all the time. But it's it's you're you're never done with that person when you have the kids involved, right? <laughs> so so um, it's just that change in relationship, right? So do you have any advice for those people that are just now starting to go through that process? Absolutely, like you said, you know, getting divorced is just the signing of some papers. It doesn't mean your ex stops being an asshole. It doesn't mean you're done with this person forever. It doesn't mean really anything. All it means is that you're not viewed as married in the in the eyes of the state. And so what I like to tell women, because I work with women or anybody listening, is not to rush the process because getting from point A to point divorced really doesn't change much. I mean, sure, maybe it sounds better when you start dating again that you're not in the middle of the divorce process. But if you're going to rush the process, you're going to make so many mistakes. You are going to make emotionally fueled de decisions versus rational ones. Those are the ones that are very hard to undo in any post-judgment litigation. And 
you're really going to be kicking yourself in the butt for not having thought things through more thoroughly. So don't look at divorce, the actual like divorce day as the finish line. Like don't look for a finish line at all. Like just sort of take it really strategically and make well-informed, educated decisions and move on with your life because you don't need that day to be like the deciding factor for you. Yeah, Nate and I both, um, so we were both divorced and also co-parents. We have 50-50, um, Nate's got two kids, I have three. So we co-parent 50-50 and then we have also blended our family. And so we have then on the times when we're together, we have often our, our five kids are together um, on weekends and such. So one question I wanted to ask you is in this transition where you moved from, um, from being post-divorce single to being married, and now you've got your daughter and your stepdaughter. Mm -hmm. um, what advice do you have for families that are going through through that um, transition of blending families and moving, you know, both navigating the co-parenting relationship with your ex? Oh my God, it's with a lot. New, the new, yeah, it's a big question, big question, <laughs> but you're living all of that yourself. And so I did want to get your your take on that and what advice you have to, to you know, to both men and women. I mean, I know you, you work specifically with women, but. Um, also to maybe dads who are listening to this, who might benefit from some of your wisdom. So if there's one thing I can say is that you don't finish blending a family, like we're called blended families, but like you're always constantly blending. Like there's no beginning and end to that because kids change, seasons change, needs change, all sorts of things change. And I know a lot of people will start out, you know, with their new relationship after divorce and they can't wait to like play house and i i always say to tread lightly go really really slow there's no rush for this too if you are secure in your relationship with this new partner the next most important thing is making sure that the kids feel secure too and if you just go from zero to 60 you can see that start to um, spiral out of control and that's it's hard to get that control back so take it really slow when i met my husband's daughter she was almost 11 she was 10 and a half so she was very conscious of the fact that you know this is a new woman in my dad's life my parents were once married she had memories of her parents marriage and i wanted to be really respectful and sensitive to that because i was a child of divorce at the same age that she was when her parents got divorced so i went very slow even though she was excited to meet me and have like a, a female influence on the days she was with her dad i waited for her to initiate oh hey can michelle come to lunch with us or you know, my, my husband is wonderful and he would want to include me in everything, but I would say, why don't you ask Jolie first if, if you want this to be a one-on-one -on -one thing or if she really wants me involved. And so I think giving that space for the relationship to grow and letting her feel a little sense of ownership in it has made all the difference in our relationship. And then with my daughter, she was two. So, you know, she would have befriended the mailman and been fine. So it was a little bit different with her, but I made a very conscious effort to not spend time away from her when I had her. I felt, you know, now I'm thrown into this life of 50-50. And of course, I want to spend all my free time with my new boyfriend, but I also don't want to take away from my time with her. Um, I was very strategic about how we all spent time together, if we were going to spend time together. So that helped us by the time we all moved in together. It was like, done really strategically and slowly. Now, when it comes to dealing with our ex-spouses and still maintaining a happy relationship, that's an art form. As I'm sure you guys know, um, even in the best, most amicable of situations, it's still a pain in the ass when your new husband's ex-spouse or your new wife's ex-spouse is consistently interjecting themselves and opinions and trying to rule the roost from afar. And I know because I'm a mom and I'm slightly controlling. And when my daughter's with her dad, I sometimes overstep my boundaries. But the important thing there is boundaries. And for a healthy relationship, I think it's important that you acknowledge that there was a parent that came before you, but also set some ground rules with you and your new partner about what are we going to allow here? Are we going to let your high conflict ex-spouse run all over us and make decisions? Or are we gonna say, no, this is our time with the kids, thanks but no thanks. And and you gotta keep the lines of communication open and not be scared because it can be very hard. Do you think there is a role for your uh, uh, co-parent um, as far as meeting the, the new interest? Like, um, would you introduce the person to your your co-parent first before introducing them to the kids? Do there, no. Is there any role that they would play at all in the in that? 
No. And while I think it's important for your co-parent to meet the person you're going to now spend the rest of your life with, hopefully, uh, I don't think that you're looking for their approval. Um, you don't need their permission. You don't need them to be best friends with your new partner in order for things to be okay. I think it's fine to introduce your child first because what's most important is your child's relationship with that person, not your ex, your ex's relationship. And if you do introduce your partner to your co-parent first before the kids, you are running the risk of even if this is the greatest person in the world, a jealous ex-spouse saying, well, I don't like him, I don't want him around my kids, and now what? Now what do you do? Now you put yourself up against a wall. So I would say when the time is right for you and your family, introduce the kids slowly. Obviously let your ex know that that's something you're doing. And if you're going to be moving in together, walking down the aisle, then you can coordinate a meeting between the two of them, which is what me and my now husband did. I had lunch with his ex-wife before we got married and before we moved in together. And he took my ex-husband for coffee right after we got engaged. And that was the right timing for us. Yeah, I think that's that makes so much sense, the timing of it. I I um I had that also. My my ex-husband is also remarried and I met his now wife um before before he introduced her to the kids, which in our case was fine. We're we're pretty amicable and it was a it was good timing for us. But um I will say that the the biggest uh, benefit from that, as you're as you're saying, Michelle, was for for me, it was my three kids knew that I had met Laura, that I had met their now stepmom, and that I that there was no choosing between us. Like I sort of said, right. I've met her; she seems very lovely. I'm really happy for your dad, um, you know. And 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 then they were able to like have permission in a way to be able to allow her into their life and her and her role and in her way. And, you know, she's never going to be their mom. I'm their mom, but, um, but she, you know, is going to be an adult in their life. I'm um, in the same way that I'm an adult female presence in mm-hmm. eight kids lives. And so, um, just kind of keeping those, keeping those relationships clear in your head and taking the higher road, even though it's, you know, I'm not saying I really like how to lovely time at lunch with, you know, my ex's new wife or whatever. She actually is a really nice person, but it's, you know, like those things are hard. They're hard to yeah. do, but we just have to like put on our adult pants and like do it. Yeah. And um, I love that you, you, kids. you're very lucky to be in a space, an amicable space where you could meet her before the kids did. But I think the majority of people are not, at least the women right. that I work with are dealing yep. with very high conflict situations, um, where their exes want to control what they do for the rest of their lives. And they're working really hard to reestablish control over their own lives and, and live this autonomous life without this person, you know, dictating what they do or how they do it. And so in a perfect world, we'd get to do that. But the way around that, and I do think it's a great point you bring up with letting your kids know it's okay to welcome this person into your space is to talk to them about it. You know, say, hey, I don't know her, but it's great. Tell me the things you like about her. What are the things you've done that were fun? Um, my mom is is the example for all that I do in my divorce life. She had a really rough hand dealt to her. My dad had been having living a double life with another woman and Eventually, my mom caught on and the marriage was over and I was eight years old and her and my grandparents sat me down after school one Friday afternoon and said, mommy and daddy are getting divorced. Daddy has a new girlfriend. And two hours later, they were in the driveway picking me up for dinner. My dad and this new woman and obviously not the way to go about things. And I'm always like, mom, really? But my mom came to the car, the window, like a lady. She said, hi, Connie. It's very nice to meet you. Please take good care of my girl have a great weekend. And I'm like, wow, just that sense of confidence that my mom displayed when she could have come to the window, like guns blazing and like telling her off, you know, which I'm sure she wanted to do on the inside. That was enough for me to feel secure. So just having open conversations with your kids, not engaging in alienation, making them feel like it's okay. It's just another person who might want to love them and spend time with them. I think that's enough if you can't meet the person and have lunch ahead of time. Um, so it's back to school time right now. Um, yes. And uh, so I had a question. Uh, we actually get this a lot from some of our uh, members at Avail. Um, and they're asking about what to do um, for like back to school clothing, supplies, lunch boxes, ice packs, those type of things. Um, how, how is that usually 
split up who pays for what <laughs> do you have any yeah. suggestions there i don't know if you guys find out let me know no i'm just kidding i'm still perfecting <laughs> still perfecting the art form but this year i tried something new so normally i would go and buy all the stuff and just say hey bella's dad give me half the money but Belle is now at an age where she has like actual homework and she has to wear a uniform and it's very hard to have things going back and forth. So I said, Hey, why don't we do this? Like, this is the uniform store literally across the street from your house, pick some up, have them on hand. Here's what she's going to need at home. Make sure you have it at home for her homework because I can no longer work full time for the supplies and the things and be running things back and forth. And it just gets really, really hard. So my best advice is if you're in a position to have supplies in both places, do that. Like that takes the stress off the kids over having to remember, you know, their highlighter or whatever notebook they need to have at home to take notes in. The uniform issue gets a lot easier when each parent has their own. Um, and if, you run the issue like I, my issue is that if it's no matter whose day it is, I pick my daughter up from school. So she might be coming home in her the uniform that's from her dad's house. I change her. I put it in a bag and I give it right back. You kind of have to stay on top of it. Otherwise, you are a slave to the stuff. Mm -hmm. I was I was at my daughter's back to school thing last night in her classroom and my daughter was with her dad and he texts me. She doesn't have her headband. And I'm like, my first instinct was to leave early go get the headband and bring it because my daughter's going through a phase where she cannot cannot leave the house will not without a headband so there's this one headband in particular we're very like into it and i said to him you know what this would be a great activity for you guys to do tonight take her to target have her pick out some headbands she loves to keep at your house because this one headband going back and forth is nuts and he was like okay that's a good idea and he took her like right there and she called to show me her new headband problem solved so if you can keep things in two homes, that is the best advice I can give you. If you can't, um, because of financial reasons, another thing that's really helpful is if you involve your child's teacher and say, hey, we're co-parenting, we're in two different homes, stuff might get left behind. Can you help at the end of the day and just remind my child that they need X, Y, and Z tonight and maybe they can take it from their desk and return it in the morning? or. I know she's always running low at pencils at her dad's. Can she take one from her pencil case and bring it back with her tomorrow? And then you're now not not only letting the teacher know that it's not irresponsibility on your child's part if something doesn't come back to school or stays in one parent's house, and you're also teaching your child a little independence and ownership over their stuff and taking responsibility for their things. So that's another option always. Yeah, we've, we've noticed that with our kids as well. It's uh, the one big thing was stuffed animals going back and forth between homes. And if they didn't have that one stuffed animal at bedtime, it was it was an emergency, you know. It was... And I appreciate that. And I've dealt with that. My daughter and I have had this thing for years where I have a Minnie Mouse. She has a Mickey Mouse and she takes it with her to her dad's to feel connected to me. And there's been so many times where we can't find one of them. But something I always encourage is even though you want your child to have everything they want all the time and feel safe and good, life isn't really like that. And if she can work for my daughter, it was important that her and her dad work to establish their own things and routine. And so she had like her things that were like solely for her and her dad and her things that were just for me and her. So it wouldn't be as impactful if she forgot a stuffed animal. She knows she had such and such toy at dad's and that was what made her feel connected to being at dad's house. You know, one thing too that I notice is that as much as we, so, so my ex and I have separate things as you're saying at each at each of our houses, which does really help a lot with my three kids, um, except for things like jackets and shoes, like there's things that, you know, go back and forth. Um, but I used to just get myself in like freak out mode about the Tupperware. Because I always, he always had my Tupperware or my ice packs for lunches. And oh, I'm packing you know what? Or there, whatever. And I just finally yes. had to like buy more and let it go. Right. But so the ice packs. Like, look, there's just some stuff that's going to get lost or like mixed up or that outfit's never going to come back to mm -hmm. my house. And I bought it and like, it should be that. in my house, but it's not in my house. And like, I can, you know, I can get myself all spun up about it or I can just actually just say, you know what? This is let like it go. Home part of it and I gotta let it go. So you can like strive for the ideal and then and then at some point let it go. The ice packs is a trigger for me because <laughs> I don't put an ice pack 
ice pack in Bella's lunchbox. She leaves the house at eight for school. They eat lunch at 10 a.m. Like, Her we're not... Talk- we're not talking about like, you know, she's not having frozen, you know, French fries for lunch. She doesn't need an ice pack. My ex insists on an ice pack. <laughs> and she comes home from school to my house and the ice pack nine times out of 10 gets left here. So I can expect at least three times a week to get a text. You forgot the ice pack. And I want to be like, screw the ice pack. But OK, like, fine. Like this. These are the things that little nuances that you don't expect. But um, yeah, like you have to let it go at a certain point or everybody's going to be driven nuts. Totally. Totally. I have a, I have a, um, a kind of a personal question for you too, just about the taking a leap to get remarried. I yeah. think so many people coming out of, you know, divorce, it's like, well, I don't ever want to go through that again. And we all know the statistics of second marriages. And um, I, I just am curious about your own personal process to take that leap of faith with your with your husband and and to say I'm gonna I'm gonna do this again. First of all, I think it's so weird that the statistics for a second divorce being higher than the first. Like, I everyone I meet who's remarried for the second time is like there is nothing better than a second marriage. Like there is so much compassion and understanding, especially if you're marrying another divorced person. It's wild to me. But anyway, that being said, I am very good at trusting my gut instincts. Well, I got good at it. Clearly, I wasn't always good at it. But um, I knew in my marriage to my first husband, I suffered a lot in that marriage, not at the hands of him, almost more at the hands of my own issues that I had not dealt with yet. And I kind of knew, I finally saw clearly for the first time, why relationships had not gone well for me up until that point. And I made a conscious decision in my before my first marriage even ended to work on myself and those things that kept putting me in these unhealthy relationships and these toxic patterns. And with that, I, I remember telling my therapist at the time, like, I know that I haven't had a fair chance at love, at marriage. Like, you know, a lot of people will joke their first marriage was a practice run. This very much was for me because I did not know enough about myself and relationships in my first marriage to have a healthy, long lasting relationship. And I kind of had this gut feeling that my real marriage was out there. My my more emotionally evolved life was out there waiting for me. I just had to work to get to it. And so I kind of just knew like I wasn't done with love yet and I wasn't fully out of like the the realm of or I wasn't out of chances yet for a happy marriage, I should say. And then when I met my now husband, who was the first person I dated after my divorce, dated, not like saw or hooked up with, um, officially dated, I knew before our first date that I'd be marrying him. And I knew after the first date like that it was it was signed, sealed and delivered. It just was one of those things. <laughs> That's awesome. That sounds magical, but also not magical because you did the work. So, and I'm still doing the work. And I have to say, like, there is no, you know, I see all of these things on Instagram about being healed and you're never fully healed. Like right. you're healing always, just like you're always blending the family. And I think staying committed to the fact that you're not a perfect person, but you want to be a better person for the better outcome of this relationship is where the magic really is. And I didn't see that the first time. I didn't see that all of my stuff could completely destroy a relationship because it was unhealed and I had no concept of what even needed healing. Yeah, that ability to um, recognize and not repeat negative patterns um, coming out of the first marriage I think you know we're, we're a lot more um, reflective now. I think we, we have a lot more tools at our disposal uh, mm-hmm. so that we are able to do the work like you described so that we can go into our next relationships and be a, a lot more, uh, have a lot more intention for what we're looking for. So exactly. yeah, I appreciate that. So you have a book coming out. You have uh, the Moms Moving On podcast and then a, a book to go along with that. You want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so I... Last year, after I started the podcast, which I started to help answer all the questions I was getting on social media all the time, I was like, well, I need to answer these well and thoughtfully, so let me bring on experts to speak to that. I then took the necessary steps to become somewhat of an expert myself. I became a certified divorce specialist. I've taken a lot of um, certification programs in trauma, resilience, and 
all that jazz. And um, I decided, you know what, it's finally time to put all this into a book. Because what I needed when I got separated, you know, I had a book like what to expect when you're expecting when I was pregnant, but I didn't have one for divorce. And then all of the self help stuff after divorce was really driven towards women who were older with kids, you know, approaching high school age or empty nesters or gray divorce, all that stuff. There wasn't something speaking primarily to young parents and I was 33 and that's what I needed. So that's what I created. It's essentially a how to, what to expect when you're getting divorced as a mom. Um, there's a lot of chapters, it's almost 30 chapters and it's really broken down from, it starts from the morning you wake up, holy shit, I'm divorced. How do I get myself out of bed and also be a parent to surviving the first weekend without your kids to understanding the legal process and not letting it control your life and then getting your mojo back, getting back out there, feeling empowered for the rest of your life. And so it's everything I, th I think I needed at the time. And I am really excited for it to come out. Um, it's being published by Simon and Schuster and it's available for pre-order now on Amazon or everywhere else, Barnes and Noble, um, on the Simon and Schuster site. And it'll be physically available, uh, January 11th, 2022 on, Kindle and audiobook and hardcover. That's exciting. And and you're busy. You you also have a workshop coming up. So is it time to yeah. leave my marriage workshop? Mm -hmm. you want to tell us a little bit about that. This is born from the thousands of DMs I get every week that from women who say I'm so unhappy, but I don't know if it's time to leave my marriage. How do you know when it's right? So I put together sort of a crash course in, you know, this is really for a woman who knows it's time to leave, but doesn't know what to do next. Um, and we're gonna cover things like knowing if it's the right time for sure, questions to ask your lawyer before you leave, how to talk to your partner and your kids about divorce, um, creating a plan to help you transition into single motherhood, letting go of the guilt that comes with that, and how and when to talk to the people in your life about your divorce. Those are the toughest things I think every mom goes through. And um, so we'll be breaking that down. And at this time, we have about nine spots left. So if you're listening and you want in, please visit my website, momsmovingon.com. Look at events uh, and the workshops page and you'll be able to register. Yeah, we get we get a lot of those questions too. So Nate and I also are both divorce coaches and, and certified divorce specialists. Actually, it was your, it's funny. I followed you on Instagram and I saw your certification and I said, what is the certification? And then that's when Nate and I went and did our certification after we saw yours. So thank you for tipping us off to isn't Liz the best? This is awesome. Love Liz. Yeah, she's she's amazing, and we, we have so, some experience with that certification. But we hear everyone with our clients. Like it's it's like yeah. you know sometimes we'll do a discovery session with somebody, or I'll even do my first divorce coaching session with somebody, and at the end of the session they're like, you know, I think I just need to maybe try some marriage counseling a little bit longer, um, and or, or you know I think I want to give this another go, or you know sometimes it's like there's some back and forth before a person's really ready to take that leap. And so it, you know, it is a real discernment process. It's really great that you have a workshop that's focused specifically on that for moms. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. You're maybe two to four years um, on average that people will consider getting a divorce before they actually mm -hmm. take a move on it, which mm -hmm. I mean, that's a long time to be in limbo. So it, it's nice to have uh, something available for those that are uh, on the fence, you know. Just and I think bosses. in so many ways, the limbo is necessary because you really want to weigh all your options. Um, you know, I always say there's no woman that just wakes up one day and is like, hey, I think I'll get divorced now. Um, there's so many years of contemplating and thinking and hopefully trying and hopefully marriage counseling and hopefully maybe a break and getting back together, or hopefully a sexy vacation to try and reignite some passion, hopefully all those things, because Women in particular carry a lot more guilt when it comes to divorce and choosing to end their marriage. And you want to be able to lay your head down at night knowing you did everything you could and tried as hard as you possibly could. Yeah. And at the end of the day that you're part of, you know, half of the marriages that that don't end in death, right? That do end in, <laughs> in divorce. And so I think, you know, part of it too is like you said at the very beginning, Michelle, that mind that mindset shift of if you do get to the point where you just know in your being that you're that you've done what you can do and you're and you're and you're done and it's over and there isn't a way back to reconciliation, um, you know, letting go of that guilt for yourself and letting go of that shame for yourself because um, you're in really good company. Like there's so many I've met so many amazing divorced women who 
you know, whether they're into, you know, second marriages or choosing a different path or, you know, whatever comes after the divorce um, that, that are, that are so much happier and more healed and more whole and, and phenomenal parents to their kids. So, um, you know, just for anyone listening that needs that little bit of a mindset shift, it's divorce is not the end, it's the beginning. Amen. Yeah. And, and you know what people will say to me, oh, it's so easy for you to say that you're remarried. I felt this way before I ever met Spencer. And just like I said, I just saw this as like an open-ended opportunity. I had never been single ever before. I went from relationship to relationship. I now had a daughter who motivated me, motivated me more than ever. And I just really wanted to make the most out of this new situation in my life. Well, thank you. I think those were all my questions. I don't know, Nate, do you have other, anything else you, you wanted to ask before we let Michelle go? Um, no, I think we covered it all. Okay, good. Well, thank you so much for your time. We will definitely be, um, you know, in our in our webinar notes on our YouTube channel and um, on our Avail TV channel, we'll be linking to your book and your website and your Instagram to be sure that people know where to find you. Um, and just thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate your your wisdom and sharing your journey with everybody who who is learning from it. Ah, oh, of course. I love that you guys do this and and had me on. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you.